do your due diligence, do your homework, do your research, know you, Man. know your criteria, know your goals. Why are you even investing in the first place? It starts right, right there. Welcome to The Real Deal, a commercial real estate investing podcast. I'm your host, Aman Shahi. There's a ton going on in the world right now, and much of it impacts real estate investors. The Real Deal podcast will take a look at what's happening and how it influences you as a real estate investor. Each episode is a 20-minute segment dedicated to distilling the day's most important news, so you can stay up to date on what's going on in the world and how it might affect the commercial real estate market. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Cashflow Capitalist Show. I'm your host, Aman. In today's episode, we have a special treat for all of our listeners. I'll be sitting down with my good friend, Travis Watts, a very seasoned investor and a, having a wealth of knowledge in the passive investment area. We'll be diving deep into two crucial concepts that every passive investor need to be aware of. First is the top 10 essential questions you must ask before investing in as a passive investor. The second question is the strategies and tips on how to effectively vet sponsors before making that investment decision, whether you are a seasoned investor or just starting out. The, this episode promised to provide valuable insight that could shape your investment journey. So let's jump right in. Hey, Travis, how's it going? Hey, Iman. Thrilled to be here, man. Thanks for the invite. Um, I have a question. So what are the 10 certain questions every new passive investor needs to know before investing as a limited partner? Great topic. Happy to dive into it. Feel free to share any that you have as well. But these are 10 things that just came to mind as we were kind of brainstorming where I've made a lot of mistakes in my passive investing journey, especially early on around 2015, 2016. So I'll give you a little background on each one. And the first one is that I started investing in limited partnerships in 2015, 16, where I was heavily analyzing the deal itself, trying not to make the wrong decision, trying to find the highest yield, highest potential return. And I forgot to really consider what my objectives are, what my goals are. So the first one I put on my list is know your criteria and know what goals you're trying to achieve. For me, it was that I was going to begin living on passive income. So I needed something that distributed, let's say, on a monthly basis, not a biannual, not in two to five years, but monthly right out of the gate. So some people are using, let's say, a self-directed IRA. They have a 20-year time horizon. They could care less about cash flow. They have a high-paying job right now. They don't need it. So they might be inclined to look at a new development deal or something that doesn't necessarily produce passive income. So know your goals, know your objectives, and know your criteria is number one. Don't overanalyze. Don't overanalyze, man. It's easy, especially in the beginning, again, to get caught up in the analysis by paralysis. You start finding out all this lingo about T12s and T3s and digging through these financial statements and thinking, you know, why does the landscaping cost 300 grand a year? And you're really getting caught in the weeds because it has a lot more to do with the operator and the market and the deal itself at large. So number two, I put on my list as uh, the track record of the team. So I've partnered in all types of deals from groups that have 20 plus year track record to student deals where they're doing their second or third deal and they've never even sold a deal before. And in the private space, unlike the publicly traded markets, when you're analyzing a, a long term stock, a blue chip company that's been around for 50 plus years, you don't always have the track record and the same types of data to look at on a private placement. So the number one metric, if I could only look at one thing uh, when doing a private placement, I would ask about their track record. Is this your, your specialty? Is this all that you focus on? How many deals have you purchased? How many deals have you sold and or refinanced? Have you had 
a capital call where you had to ask your investors for more money? Did a deal go south? And if it did, that doesn't eliminate them from my list. I just ask, what happened? What were the circumstances? How did you remedy that? Did you remedy that? And what was the outcome? And then what kind of helps you from making that same mistake again moving forward? So that's number two. Perfect. All right. Number three is, is the deal located in a growing and expanding market that's also diversified among different employment sectors? I think we all know what happened to, say, Detroit, Michigan during the Great Recession, right? A lot of those multifamily units went nearly completely vacant. A lot of people lost their jobs because a lot of people work specifically in automotive and there wasn't a lot of diversification outside of that. So, I've primarily been a Sunbelt market investor from Texas to Florida to the Carolinas to Arizona to Georgia. But more specifically, you can't just generalize and say Georgia is a great place to invest, right? There's some little podunk towns out in Georgia that may not be the best in terms of growth and population and diversification among employment. So markets are hugely important. I would argue they're not the most important, but they are very important to understand. But but uh, how any limited investor can do the market research to find out if it's growing market or is it sustained? How, how do they do it? Yeah. There's a lot of free data out there through Marcus and Millichap, through Yardi Matrix, through CBRE. Most of these sources, uh, CoStar is another one. You don't have to pay for a subscription. In fact, I was just reading yesterday the latest uh, Yardi Matrix metrics, and they go nationwide and they'll make a multifamily report and they'll show you all the markets that are exceeding national average falling behind the national average, et cetera. That's one starting point. And then usually the general partner is going to give you some sort of color as to why this market, why this submarket, and what is in the area. Sometimes you'll see on an overview, maybe here's all the, the businesses around the area. Most people are commuting within five to seven miles from the property, et cetera. Those are things that I look for. Got it. Got it. What are the things? All right. Number four is the state in which the property is located. What a lot of people fail to think about is if I'm doing a deal in Texas or Florida, they have no state income tax. So when it comes time to sell those deals, I'm not having to worry about filing an additional tax return. I'm not worried about, let's say, a particular state has a 9% state income tax. Well, you think about making a hundred grand on a deal, that's nine thousand dollars cut right off your, your bottom uh, line profit. Are you talking about so, California? <laughs> <laughs> California, I think, is a range right up to like 13% or something crazy. I don't know. I don't know. That's uh, New York's you know high too, Illinois is high. So I tend to, again, I look at the Sun Belt. Not every state is going to be tax-free. I do a lot of Georgia investing. They've got roughly a 5% state tax, but still it's relatively low considering the spectrum of 13 to zero, right? All right. So number five is what type of debt are you using? And this has become incredibly important here in recent times. This is more of a recent mistake of mine about two, two years ago, roughly speaking. Are they doing fixed rate debt? We're in an, in an era where the Federal Reserve is, is raising interest rates. So if you're getting a 5% mortgage today, it might be seven or eight down the road. We don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm a fan of fixed rate. And if it's going to be adjustable, meaning that it's going to move with SOFR and what the Fed does, you can buy an interest rate cap, which essentially caps out your risk at a certain level. So using that same example, 5% loan today, 6 or 7% interest rate cap means if rates go above 7, you're not having to adjust up to 8, 9, or 10%, for example. So it's a risk mitigation strategy. You can also get what's called an assumable loan, which means if we're locking in at 5% today and we sell in two or three years, the next buyer can potentially take over our loan with the same interest rate that we have, meaning 5% instead of potentially a higher rate down the road. So debt's very important. Not a fan of short-term debt, not a fan of adjustable if you're not going to buy an interest rate cap. So just be aware that you know, the, the Fed goes in cycles. Interest rates come down, interest rates go up, they come down, they go up. So just realize where we are in the cycle. Got it, got it. 
Perfect. All right. Number six, what is the minimum investment? And the reason I point this out is there's usually a range between, let's call it 25,000 minimum to 100,000 minimum. If you're working with only 100,000 total, meaning that's your total amount of capital that you have to invest, you may not want to go into one deal with 100,000. You may want to break that up into 50K here and 50K there yeah. or Four deals with 24, uh, 25,000, excuse me, just to further diversify. I'm sorry, what's that? Or invest in a fund. Or invest in a fund. So simple math suggests that if a fund or a portfolio has five properties and I do 100,000, I'm allocating roughly 20,000 per property. So that's a pretty low number and that's how I look at it. I tend to invest heavier in the fund models than I do in an individual deal, but that's mm. just me. Got it. All right. Number seven is um, when is the first distribution? I made this mistake only once, just assuming because this group was buying a stabilized property that theoretically had immediate cash flow. But the business plan suggested they were going to put a lot of that uh, capital. They were going to hold it back and reinvest it into the property for six to eight months. So as someone who lives on passive income, that did me no favors for six to eight months. You know, hopefully when it comes full cycle, it all ends up being a, a solid return. But it's important to know most operators are going to send your first distribution on something that's stabilized and produces cash flow within, let's call it a 90 day time frame. So just know, again, if you're going into new development, know if it's not going to be three, four or five years later that you get any kind of return on your money. That gets back to knowing your goals and objectives. Are you trying to build monthly cash flow or are you just trying to build equity for the long term? It's not right or wrong, good or bad. It just depends on you. Yeah, same thing when you said uh, know your criteria. 100%. And that's why I put that as number one, because to me, that's that's really the most important thing. The last thing you want to do is invest 100 grand into some illiquid investment for years on end and realize, oh, I should have done something else with that money, but now I can't touch it. So it's one of the risks and uh, things that you have to consider. All right. Uh, do you do monthly or quarterly reporting? So because I invest mostly in things that produce monthly cash flow, they usually do monthly reporting. And the reason I like that is it gives me a closer pulse on what's happening at the property level. What's the current occupancy? What's the current collections? Um, you know, if I want to dig into the numbers, I have those available to me and I don't have to wait three or four months for them to say, we're going to pause distributions or by the way, a tornado hit our property two months ago or you know whatever happened. I just like to be a little more in the know. But again, that, that's a personal preference. Some people prefer as a passive investor to be more hands off and to not have to look at things uh, every month, depending on how many deals you have. Uh, on that same note, a quick side note on there, do they offer you the full detailed financials? Again, don't get caught up in the analysis by paralysis, but are they transparent with you in sharing every line item or what each resident's paying or what have you? I like to have that level of transparency. Uh, I was with an operator for three years and after investing, I realized they never share detailed financials with their investors. And I found that to be um, yeah, not my preference. Let's say that. Got it. <laughs> so, got it. Uh, number nine, does the deal offer a preferred return or what some people call a coupon? This is not a promise or a guarantee. What this means is the first cash flow that the property produces after you pay for your overhead cost and your debt and all of that comes to the limited partners. Okay. You and I. And so before I should add, before the general partners start sharing in the pool of profit. So it's usually a stronger deal, in my opinion. If they offer a preferred return, it gives a little more of an incentive to pay out and to not stop distributions. They should accrue depending on the structure of the deal. So it's not like if they pause distributions, you're, you're, you're never going to get them. Uh, they should catch those up when they can through a refinance, through a sale, or for operational uh, upside and performance. And number 10, I invested in a deal years ago and I never asked them about when they deliver their K-1s. And it's pretty common that sometime in March of each year, you're going to get a K-1 tax form. That's what you get when you're a limited partner 
in a syndication, right? It's not a 1099, it's not a W-2, it's a K-1. The problem with an operator extending, so I, I again, I did a, a partnership where they don't issue the K-1s until September or October of every year. That meant I had to file an extension every single year on my tax return for the whole lifespan that I'm in that particular investment. And it's a pain in the butt because you're just sitting around wanting to get things moving, but you can't. So again, personal preference, but uh, the sooner the better. Ask what CPA firm they're working with. Do a little due diligence there and just ask if they've ever delivered K-1s beyond the March deadline. That would be one thing. So not an all-inclusive list by any means. That's just 10 that came off the top of my head that I find are very important. We could probably make a list of 100 items, but I know oh, we're yeah. limited on time here today. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think you shared like really great knowledge right now. Every investor, they still have those questions like, how do I do it? How, what certain things should I keep in mind? And I would say like, thanks, thanks for your wisdom. Well, you got it, man. Hopefully that added some value to your listeners. Um, Your listeners can always reach out to me too. Happy to have a more in-depth conversation over these topics. And how can they reach out to you? Uh, Travis at ashcroftcapital.com or on social media, Travis Watts, W-A-T-T-S, or at Passive Investor Tips. You can reach me. Perfect, perfect. All right, Travis, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. I'll see you later. Thanks, Aman. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Travis, for sharing information on those 10 important questions. Now, as we're moving to our next segment, we'll be discussing another important aspect of passive investing, vetting investors, how to vet sponsors. So let's jump right in. Hey, Travis. Um, I met a guy a long time ago. He asked me how to trust these sponsors before you invest with them, how to vet them. So what are, what are your views on that? How, how anybody can trust these sponsors? How did you trust these sponsors? It's a great question, and it's a difficult one to answer, and I think a lot of uh, limited partners go about it in different ways. Mm -hmm. So what I found to be really useful, uh, the way I took this approach is I first started online with different real estate forums and bigger Mm -hmm. pockets and stuff. That led me into nationwide conferences, Mm -hmm. and the benefit to those is that you can network with people face-to-face. You can really get to know people after hours or during the sessions or on a networking break or over a dinner or what have you. And to me, that makes a big impact when I can meet somebody face to face and really hear their story and get to know them. But that's just me personally. I like to invest with groups that have a known track record that are reputable in the industry. There's a few different sites out there that you can rank or rate different operators. Mm -hmm. They're not fully developed yet. They're not quite to the extent of like a Yelp or something like that, Mm -hmm. but at least you get kind of a guideline. And I like to work with groups that are very transparent. You know, they have multiple business ties and relationships industry wide. They're speaking on stage, they're writing books, they're operating a podcast like you are. They're they're putting themselves out there to the world. They're not just operating in some office building where no one's heard of them, you know. So that's the biggest thing. And the truth of it is, Amon, you you know, it, we think back to like some of the biggest, you know, scams in, in the industry, yeah. like a Bernie Madoff or something. Before that guy was found out in the Great Recession or just after, you could have run a background check on him. You could have met him face to face. You know, he was out there in the public eye. I mean, he had his own sons and family working in the business with him. And turns out he was a scam, you know, so it can be really difficult to know with 100 percent certainty who you're working with. So the best approach I've found is to diversify. And that has been the whole reason for me being a full-time limited partner investor in the first place. I can be in different asset classes. I can be in different markets. I can put 50K here. I can put 50K there. And you're eliminating political risk. You're eliminating natural disaster risk. You're Mm -hmm. eliminating the potential that a deal goes south or underperforms or that You know, if you do happen to get in a bad situation where there is a a scam of some sort, at least you have a lot of other income streams to make up for it. And that could be said with anything, whether you're a stock investor uh, with a company like Enron that went completely bankrupt. That was a big national known American company that had the trust of hundreds of thousands of people. And they ended up, you know, being a fraudulent company. So you can never know 
with certainty, but those are some of the steps yeah. that, that I've taken uh, to, to vet. You know, you definitely have to have a conversation uh, with these people. You definitely have to ask the difficult questions and do your own due diligence and then diversify. That's really the, the steps that I take. And many uh, limited partners who are like doctors, lawyers, they don't have time to go anywhere else. To, you know, they, they don't have time to go to conferences. What's the right. least, amount, least amount of work they can do to find these sponsors and learn about them before investing with them? So, that's a great point. So the more information and knowledge you have, the lower mm -hmm. your risk level is, right? If you're investing with your long-term friend that you've known for 30 years, right? You're taking a little less risk if he's experienced and has a track record, et cetera, because you don't really have to do the background check. You, you have that level of trust. So for people in those situations, and I used to be in that situation working in oil and gas, 100 hour work weeks, working overseas, I would at least hop on a Zoom call. I would at least have a couple different phone calls. I would ask for referrals. I would ask for any testimonials. I would get to know other people who were investing with these companies. And back to the conferences, although that was your other question, that's a great thing. I always ask other limited partners like myself, who are you investing with and what has your experience been with that operator? That's one of my, my favorite questions to ask. That's how I've found a lot of different people to partner with over the years. And again, there's no uh, risk-free strategy out there. There's no you know guaranteed way to know these things. But the more transparency, the more information, the more references and referrals, the better, generally speaking. Or go to meetups. Or go to meetups, man. Launch your own meetup. Like, it doesn't matter how you do it. You could do it online. You could do it over the phone. You could do it over Zoom. You could do it at conferences. You could listen to podcasts. You can get on YouTube. There's a lot of different outlets. But you do you and figure out what you have time yeah. and, and a budget for and just try to maximize that. Thanks, man. Thanks for the knowledge again. Thank you so much. I love to be you, you being a guest all the time. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks. One last thing I want to add uh, to your listeners is uh, the, there were two people that got me into the space of being a limited partner in the first place, and I call them mentors of mine. So when I say mm -hmm. mentorship, that doesn't have to mean paid programs or paid mentors or consultants mm -hmm. or coaches. That can simply mean reach out to people who are doing what you want to do successfully and make them your mentor. Try try to find a way to add value. Don't take a ton of their time. Get organized, write your questions down, take a 10 minute phone call with them and just try to pick their brain. And that helped me tremendously branch into this industry. And it helps me today. I'm still reaching out to other limited partners that have more experience than I have to ask mm -hmm. them about either a deal or a particular mm -hmm. operator or a particular strategy or whether they've invested in, in a particular asset class things like that. So that can be a huge help. Find a mentor. Yeah, just do your homework. Do your due diligence, do your homework, do your research, know you, Man. know your criteria, know your goals. Why are you even investing in the first place? It starts right. right there. There you go. All right, man. Thank you so much. I'll see you later. All right. Thanks, Saman. Right. Thanks, everyone. All right. And that wrap up another insightful episode of the Cashflow Capitalist Show. A huge thank you to Travis Ward for joining us today and sharing his invaluable expertise. For all our listeners, remember, knowledge is power, but applying that knowledge is what truly makes a difference. If you found value in today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, share, and leave us a review. Until next time, keep capitalizing and happy investing on the cash flow. Thank you for joining us on The Real Deal, a commercial real estate investing podcast, the show that covers everything to do with multifamily real estate investing to help you become an expert in your real estate ventures. We're here to help you create passive income and financial freedom so that you can achieve what you want whenever you want. We'll catch you next time on The Real Deal.